we have to come together to worship our God. Mercy is it's, it's a great, great time. Like I said, I love to I love to praise His name when I think about how great He is, how awesome He is. Because you know, but today, uh, why He wrote with me? He said, "I'm oh, Robert Pops the church." He wrote with me. We're coming in, and, and we got talking about God, and just always try to take every opportunity I can with my young grandchildren. And I said, "You know, we we can't really pay God back." He said, "Well, we can pray." I said, "Yeah," and we do that, and we can never really pay back for all the good stuff He does for us. And so that is so true. Now, for those who worship here often, get ready. Here it goes. We exist to share. Help, hope, hope. Help, hope, and home. We exist to share help for people's lives, hope for their future, and a place to call home. And we do that by connecting, uh, by growing spiritually, connecting with the lost, showing compassion, and equipping disciples. So, I want those of you like, dude, you've been saying that every week since you started this service. That's because I want it to be so ingrained in us that it, it's just natural for us to do that, to share help, hope, and home. Not only in this building, but especially out in the world in which we live. That, that is so stuck in our minds that we're like, I've got to be offering people help, hope, and home. And, and so that's why we keep saying that we not only have a mission statement and a vision statement, but we have our core values to help us make sure that as we are striving to reach these goals, we are doing it. In in a, a, a proper manner which brings God glory. That's why we've been on this sermon series. Values matter. Values matter. You know, my good friend here, Scott Gold, he's like, here we go again. I don't know how I get it every time. But anyway, Scott Gold lived in this neighborhood and, and uh, there was one house, real fancy house, and he just never hung around too much. He knew that there was some bad stuff going down there. And so he knew that it was some big money people in there, and he kind of stayed away from that in that house. And but one day, you know, he's, he's in his house there watching TV, and knock on the door, and these two big guys with black suits are standing there in front of his door, and, and Scott recognizes them from next door. He's seen them go in and out, and, and Scott's like, "Can I help you?" And he said, "Yeah, the big guy wants to see you next door." And Scott's like. Oh, okay, okay. So he goes with them, and Scott goes into this room, big mansion this house is, and he walks into this one room, and it's dimly lit, with a light shining on this one man there. And this one man is tied to a chair. Scott's like, what in the world am I doing in here? So anyway, he looks, and next thing you know, the shadow of a guy, you can't really see him, walks in, and then when he walks in, he recognizes him. He's the mafia leader there with Scarface. And so anyway, he walks up, and he says, hey, this punk right here, this guy in the tied in the chair, it's Guido. Guido has been with the organization for like uh, many years. Guido's our bookkeeper, and now we've got ten million dollars missing. Scott's like, "What's it got to do with me?" And so he said, "You know sign language." Scott's like, "Yeah, how'd you know?" We make your business our business. We know. And so he said, Guido's deaf. And I thought that'd be a benefit to me because he could never hear what was going on if he ever got caught in to testify. He said, but that money's missing and we want you to use sign language to tell, find out where this money is. He said, ask Guido where he did it with the money. And so Scott signs to him, you know, and, and uh, Guido signs back and Scott's like, he says, he don't know what you're talking about. And all of a sudden, before you turn around and Scott hears this click and there, one of the big guys has a gun to Guido's head. And the big guy says, you tell Guido, if he don't give you the answer to where the money is, it's over for him. So I was like, okay, man, okay. So it's got signs to him. Look, you got to show us where the money is. Your life's over. Guido signs back. He says, all right. He signed it. He's like, it is, I, I took it down to my cousin's house, two doors down, Bruno's house. And it's in a brown waterproof case buried underneath his shed in the backyard. And Scott turns around and, and, and uh, to, to look to Scarface. Scarface said, what did he say? He said, you don't have the guts to pull that trigger. <laughs> values matter. And right there, Scott's values were kind of off. And I know people who listen to me on YouTube is like, I'd like to meet this Scott Goat dude. He's a very interesting guy. All the stories he's in. But you know, our values do matter. Our values matter. And here at Hope, we have core values that help us make our decisions as leaders. So today's message is, one of our values is disciples equipping disciples. Disciples equipping disciples. And maybe 
To some of you, that kind of sounds uh, like, what, 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 what? You know, so basically, as a follower of Jesus who is helping train up other followers of Jesus, all right? And we'll explain that more as we get into it. And so I challenge you to follow along in your Bibles if you have them with you. If not, you've got your smartphone, you have a Bible. It also, most of these will be on the screen. And we're going to be in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2. The Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy, this young evangelist. So Paul is giving him some instructions about leading and growing the church. And Paul refers to Timothy as his son in the faith. Okay? He is not his, his, uh, uh, his father, but he is in the faith his father. So, and so people often ask this question, can I be a Christian and not be a disciple? Can I be a Christian and not be a disciple? First of all, I got to go like, well, I'm getting that question. You know? All right? Well, I know why. You, you want the easy ride. That's what it is. And the answer is no. A Christian is a disciple of Christ. A, a follower of Christ. An imitator of Christ. Christ-like is what it means. So, and we might be new Christians, all right? We might be new disciples. And so we're, we're justified. We don't have, you know, we're forgiven of our sins. But we also need to be being sanctified in, in that uh, we are learning, we are growing, we are being saved. In other words, we keep growing in these steps. And, and so we need to all be an imitator of Christ. And it's been said one time, a student learns what his teacher knows. A student learns what his teacher knows. But a disciple becomes what his master is. Wow. So that's pretty powerful. Before we look into God's word, let's ask God's uh, direction this morning and through prayer. So let's pray. God, you are amazing. I love to see your handiwork. I love to see how you work mysteriously through your spirit in people's lives. How you're just guiding us and, and directing us. If only we listen and hear your voice. God, I pray today that you would just take this message because, you know, I, I am nowhere fit to, to preach a message for you. And I thank you for letting me be your mouthpiece. But I pray that your Holy Spirit just ignite us today, God, to be disciples who, who uh, equip disciples. Uh, Lord, that we, would, that we would be excited about your mission here on earth and we would understand the importance of this mission. So I pray your Spirit would speak to each and every one of us, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. 2 Timothy 2, verse 1. In this part of the letter, Paul writes, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. You know, so Paul commands Timothy here, be strong. Or I like this translation. Some translations use, uh, be strengthened. Be strengthened. What's the word? <laughs> strengthened. You know, excuse me, I, it, it's, it's always amazing that when you prepare a message, you know, how when you've read something many, 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 many times through the years, but then when you're preparing, you're digging a little deeper, you, you come up with, you know, the, the true meaning maybe of what he's saying. And I love how God works because you never quit learning about God, okay? I, I love that. But Paul is aware that he's soon going to be facing death. And so he is, is training up Timothy to carry on the mission. The mission. And Paul wants the message of Jesus to continue on. And Paul knows. He knows. He's been there. Timothy's going to face a lot of trials. He's going to face a lot of troubles. And, and so he's teaching. Uh, he, he's trying to tell Timothy uh, to, to, to be able to carry on. And, and so when we look at this and we see that he sees what's going to be before Timothy, he tells him he's going to need strength. He's going to need strength. And where does the strength come from? It comes from God. But more specifically... It comes from the grace of God. It comes from the grace of God. And so we realize here as we look at this and we think about ourselves, we know we all have shortcomings. We know that sometimes we're like, I am going to do so much better in this for Jesus. And then, boom, we hit the floor. So where's our strength come from? I think that one time, uh, many times our strength comes from the grace of God. I have hit the floor, but because of God's grace, He has not given up on me. He's not thrown me out, but He will raise me up. He will lift me up from where I am. And that is my strength. To know that my God cares that much about me, that gives me strength to carry on. You see, His grace is an undeserved favor. An undeserved favor. If any of us think, you know what, I'm a pretty good person, I deserve God's favor. Uh-oh. <laughs> Watch out. I don't deserve a speck of anything from my God. I did nothing except rebel against Him many times, fall short of what He wants. I don't really deserve anything from Him. But, oh, mercy, His unmerited, undeserved favor. Don't you like that scripture? If you go back to the Old Testament and read about Noah, 
And it said, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Man, that's powerful. When, you know, if they were writing a Bible today, wouldn't they like to put your name in there? You know, so-and-so found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And years later, people were reading that going, wow. You know, so His grace gives us strength. It gives Timothy strength. It gives us in strength. And, and uh, this is a very important thing, you know, because we need the strength when we're being a disciple for Jesus. And uh, the strength of I will not give up. I will continue on. So Paul says that we're going to be strengthened by God's grace. And with that thought in mind, Paul continues. He goes on in verse 2. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust them to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Paul is laying out a plan here. And this plan is the plan of disciples uh, equipping disciples. This is what you must do with the message of Jesus. You must share. You must share. Do what? Share. Yeah. You've got to share the message of Jesus. Paul is saying, take the things that you have heard from me, learned from me, and you share them with others. Share them with people so that they can share them with other people, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. This is disciples equipping disciples. And if we stop the process, if we stop the process, we have put a roadblock in the Lord's plan. That's pretty serious right there to me. You know, you've got to put a roadblock in the Lord's plan. I don't want to discourage anyone here. So I don't want you thinking like, okay, I'm out because I can't do this. I can't be a disciple who disciples other disciples. Don't, don't throw it in yet, okay? Because we're going to talk about that. And you're going to realize, oh, yes, you can. Oh, yes, you can. No matter who you are, no matter what abilities you have, you could be a disciple of Jesus who disciples other disciples who disciples other disciples. And so, don't throw in that towel yet because we must be strengthened by the grace of God. We must share the message. And Paul continues in 2 Timothy 2, 3 through 6. 3 through 6. He says, join with me in suffering. What an invitation. Think about it. How much should join with me in suffering? Would you do that? You know, you're like, oh, God, nuts, man. What are you talking about? He said, like a soldier of Christ Jesus, no one serving as a soldier gets entangled in the civil, uh, civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the cross. So Paul challenges, uh, his challenge in disciples, equipping disciples, is to be strong. To be strong. Be what? Strong. Yeah. Join me in my suffering. Join me in suffering. Join me. So he's saying, be strong. Join me in his suffering. Following Jesus is not for wimps. All right? I'm just going to say it. Following Jesus is not for wimps. And it's terrible that we try to make Christianity so wimpified, as I call it, because, you know, everything's just okay, and I'm right, I'm a Christian, I don't have to... You know, Jesus never said that, all right? He never said that. He, he compares following Jesus to being a soldier. And he says that a soldier focuses on pleasing his commanding officer. He is doing all that he can, going through all the rough training, doing all those things to try to carry out the commands to please his officer. Be strong. Be strong. He compares being a disciple to an athlete. And a good athlete knows that you must practice hard if you want to play hard. I don't say, play, I mean, practice like you're going to play. All right? Because I, I know playing basketball back in high school, one of the things I loved is Mr. Sharp was a tough coach. All right? I mean, you ran, because that was one of his big things. You better not be out of shape. You run, run, run. His old thing was, they might beat us, but they better never beat us down the floor. You know? And, and, and so it was always, and, and I loved that challenge. I loved it. I mean, like, yeah, make us run some more. Like, that boy, is nuts, man. What's wrong with him? But yeah, it was always like, do more, do more. Press on, press on, keep going. And, and so it, it is that challenge. And Jesus never said, Follow me. It's easy. And you say, oh, he said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Yeah, but read all what Jesus says. And we're going to talk about that a little bit today. He never said, oh, if you follow me, it's going to be a smooth bed of roses. No. Um, Jesus has said he is prepared, you know, trying to prepare us to be tough, to be strong. I love this scripture in Galatians 6, 9. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. I love that. And I tell people, I baptized someone yesterday, I said, the secret to following Jesus is don't give up. You fall down, get up. 
you, you fall flat on your face, get up. You know, that's the secret. Keep getting up. Keep, you're going to fall. Keep getting up. Keep getting up. Because Jesus is there trying to help you. Okay? The only time you're going to fail is if you walk away. If you walk away. And so Paul didn't say it was just, okay, to skip along in this walk with Christ. You know, skippity doo dah, skippity day. Oh my, my, what a lovely day. He didn't say that. You know, he is telling us that it is going to be a journey. It is going to be a tough journey. So for disciples, to equip disciples, we must be strengthened uh, by the grace of God. And, and we must uh, share the message and then be strong. So what Paul is really challenging Timothy is the same thing that he's challenging you and me today. Right? Here's his challenge. Be a disciple that equips disciples. Be a disciple that equips disciples. What is the challenge for us? Okay, now that you're ready, got it in your head, say it again. Alright, yeah, when you first read like, be a disciple, yeah, yeah, it takes a little while, though. yes. Yes, it does for all of us. Kind of like, that's a little tricky there. All right, but man, that is a challenge. Hope Church wants to be a church where disciples equip disciples. So what's that look like? That's what I'm saying. I don't know if I can do that. Are you kidding me? I'm not a teacher. I'm not a preacher. Hey, hang on. We're going to get there. 2 Timothy 2, verse 7, Paul continues. He said, reflect on what I am saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. All right, so we're going to look for some of that insight today. God will give us insight. If you were here last Sunday, we talked about being filled with the Spirit. What did it look like? And you can go online and see that sermon. But we talked about what it looked like. And we had this table up here with a glass of water that poured us. When you come to know Jesus, He puts that living water in you. And I drank the water and it was clear. Then here we go to get messed in the world. And I start putting all this junk in the water and, and uh, hot sauce and everything else. And it colored the water and turned the water a different color. So what's it mean to be filled by the Spirit? And I grabbed up this uh, the other picture of water and started pouring it in there. And I grabbed it up and started pouring it in. You know, through praying, through reading God's Word, through meditating on His Word, through listening to good music, Christian music to lift you up, to have good Christian friends around you. That's how you become filled with the Spirit. You can drink the water again. And so that's the way... It is here that when we want to know more how to be a disciple, to equip disciples, we need to allow the Holy Spirit to direct us and guide us and listen to Him. You know, when we do this, we will find out how. And so putting it differently, we will learn how uh, we as followers of Jesus can lead others to lead others to follow Jesus. So, first of all, just tell you this, what Jesus said, count the cost. Count the cost. You know, sometimes people, and I've seen it, you know, they'll jump in. Oh, I want to follow Jesus. Yeah, I want to follow Jesus. Yeah, I want to follow Jesus. They ain't count the cost. Their friend, they, you know, did it. You know, I'm jumping in the water being about, hey, I am too. My friend did that. I'm going to do that. No, no, no. He says count the cost. Just like you enter a relationship. You know, relationships, it, that's one of our things around here. You know, a quote from Paul Crawford, marriage is hard. Marriage is hard. And yes, those relationships, it's kind of tough. One time, Seth Townsend back there went to his friend Nathan. And Seth said, you know what, I think I'm, I want a divorce uh, from Kate. And Nathan's like, why? He said, she hadn't talked to me in two weeks. Nathan said, a divorce? Man, a good woman like that's hard to find. <laughs> yeah, think about that. <laughs> Some of you husbands are like, sure, I laugh. <laughs> I don't want to laugh here. I'll get in trouble. But anyway, here's Jesus. He's saying that, that, you know, here now we get a little more serious. Luke 14, 25 to 27. Large crowds were following Jesus. And turning to them, he said. Now, you think he's going to say, oh, blessed are you for following me. Large crowds are following me. How are you going to have it made if you follow me? If you follow me, uh, what's he say? If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. He just tells to hate, to hate mom and dad. You know, no, you got to understand that Jewish uh, culture and the strong speech. It's a comparison of, you know, you, your love for Jesus is so strong. It is as if your love is hate for those others. In other words, Jesus must be first. Jesus must be first. And if following Jesus hasn't cost you anything, hasn't caused you to give up anything, might be a good idea to check to see if you're really following Jesus, okay? 
Because when we follow Jesus, we've got to give up some stuff. All right? And some stuff is our desires. Uh, and sometimes it's stuff that we like that maybe not quite be sinful, but really it kind of is because it takes the place of Jesus. And so therefore, you're like, dude, this is tough stuff. Yeah, but it's all worth it. It is totally all worth it because most of the times the pleasures we seek are self-destructive. Man, we destroy ourselves. It's said by Martin Luther, a religion that gives nothing, costs nothing, and suffers nothing is worth nothing. You know, I, I hear people like, you know, they talk about uh, your, your faith, your belief, you know. Well, whomever you pray to, go ahead and pray. I'm like... So you're saying that prayers are worthless because somebody not praying to the right God here, okay? There is one guy, you know, you think, you, and if they're all God, you're like, what the world are you talking about? You know, that makes no sense to me. That we need to make sure that we're following the one true God. And when we follow Him, and just like I said, even when you're playing sports, if you got there and your coach like, oh, don't worry about it, boys, I want you to sweat too much today. <laughs> you might as well go home, man, you ain't going to win too many games, all right? Because you haven't put in the tough time. You haven't put in that tough time to, to make you better at what you're doing, to keep yourself in shape. You might as well just walk home you have a little wussy coach like that. I'm telling you, you need someone who's going to whoop you into shape a little bit, a little bit. Now, disciples equipping disciples is not a ploy just to get a bigger crowd or to keep the church doors open. Not at all. I mean, here at Hope Christian, you know, the leaderships believe that equipping disciples is of the utmost importance. If you look on our website, if you look on some posters that are hanging around the building, then there's cards that are out in the lobby and out here in the small lobby where it talks about what our values are. You will see this, this on there. Disciples equipping disciples. Every believer growing within a small group community, supporting one another, and sharing their faith to reach others for Christ. Equipping disciples is important. It's important. I've been reading a book entitled When Your Church is, Feels Stuck. And it's by Chris Sunston. Sunston. Sons did, yeah, say it. it's, it's Chris. Anyway, you know, I like his quote. He says, we're not just interested in building crowds. We want to build disciples. One is not more important than the other. Now, some people here go like, well, he just, uh, you know, it's more important to have disciples than it is a crowd. And basically what he's saying as a church is that, that we have to reach out into the, uh, to the crowds in the community and bring them in and then disciple them. That's why he's saying one's not more important than the other. But he's saying our goal is to make disciples, disciple other disciples. Dave Ferguson, who was uh, quoted in that book too, and he refers to we need to be investing in people, whatever ministries we're in, because these ministries are powerful. All, all of our ministries do something more than just minister doing what their ministry says they'll do. Because there is relationship building in those relation in those. And in those relationship buildings, and you might say, well, how, how, how deep are they? I'm going to tell you it, 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 how God works is somebody's going to have a problem. And where are they going to turn? They're going to turn to where they got their relationships. And what's going to happen? They're going to grow in Jesus Christ. That's how it works. And, and so that's why it's important to belong to some type of a group somewhere so that you can have those relationships building. But Dave Ferguson says that he talks about their leadership. They're always investing in others, no matter what your job is. Because, you know, if your job is run the sound, hello, so he was like, well, can somebody who's not a believer in Christ run the sound? Yeah. Because you know what? You got them so loaded in, baby. They got to listen to the message. They're up for a running sound. They're going to hear about Jesus. So, yes. You know, and so you're training someone else. You're basically saying it's like this. I do, you watch, we talk. I do, you help, we talk. You do, I help, we talk. You do, I watch, we talk. And you go and do this for someone else. We're always looking to, to find someone else. And no matter what your ministry is, the reason behind your ministry is to share the love of Jesus. And your ministry is a kitchen ministry. And, and let me tell you, I love to eat. Yes, that's true. But there is power uh, in, 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 in eating together. You see it all through the Bible. And they sit down and they ate together. And they sit down and they, you know, Jesus, like, at one time after he had resurrected, what did he do? Hey, guys, I'm going to fix your breakfast. Come on over and eat. And, and so it's important eating together. And, and that's why sometimes people get confused. Like I say, we take the book, especially Corinthians. And we're like, we don't understand what it's saying. Some people, you can't eat in the church building. Why not? Because it says so in Corinthians. 
That doesn't make much sense because the early church ate together all the time. That wasn't a church building anyway. They ran a home, so you had to really follow the context. So no, it's not a sin. I remember years ago, I was a, a kid, and uh, this preacher was preaching revival, and he was reading up part of the scripture. One guy spoke up in church. That means we're not supposed to eat in a church building, right? And the preacher said, no, it doesn't mean that. I kept on preaching. Anyway, uh, because eating together is powerful. See, that ministry, when you're training someone else, you're not just training them to fix a good meal. But you're training them so that they show hospitality. How many times has a family come in here, and sometimes not, not even been part of this church, but yet after a funeral, a meal has been prepared to help that family in that time of grieving. And, and what, what an opportunity to serve. You know, it says this, Moody, uh, uh, Moody said this, uh, the old preacher many years ago, it is better to train ten people than to do the work of ten people, but it's harder. <laughs> That's true. That's what I have to give myself. Dave, quit trying to do it all. Dave, quit. Let it go. Let it go. But train somebody else to do it. Yeah, but they're not doing it right. And now I've got to go back and show them again. But it's better to do it. That's the plan of God. Train somebody else to do it. And sometimes you've got to back off. They're going to mess up just like you messed up when you first started. And you've got to let them go and be there to help them. But, but you've got to do it. It's better to train 10 people than to do the work of 10 people. But it's harder. And no... It, this all sounds good, but how important really is it? disciples make disciples? I mean, really? How important? So this, I don't know, a week or so ago, Brandon Rickman sent, Brandon Rickman sent me a, a, a piece of audio. And I didn't listen to it immediately because I thought it was going to be long. And so one morning I pulled into the office out here and uh, sat out in the parking lot. And I had the radio turned down low and uh, listened to K-Love. But then I decided to listen to this little audio that he had sent me. And here it was from NPR. And in NPR, they were playing an audio of an abortion procedure. And, um, and honestly, when I was hearing it, it angered me. It, it angered me because they were saying, you know, in a nonchalant way, this is how a procedure works. And, you know, the mother's a little nervous and they're quieting her down. And, and actually, this room is, is similar to a birthing room. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. You know, this thing's making me sick, it's making me angry, and then how quick it happened, I thought, yeah, murders happen quickly, uh, it, these things happen this way, and so they were trying to, you know, they were talking about how easy it was, and how it happened, and so I was like, you know, then Chris Brandon had mentioned, you know, NPR is, you know, funded by people giving, but also taxpayers' money, you know, like, you know, it just ticks me off, right, but in the background, because, you know, Brandon was asking about this, saying, you know, how, it's almost like, how do you deal with this kind of stuff? But in the background, there was a song with Stephen Curtis Chapman, and it was playing, Don't Lose Heart. Don't Lose Heart. And I thought, I need to text Brandon something encouraging, because this is so discouraging. And so, we're not going to win all these battles, battles at a battle box. We're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. Even though... Christians, really? We should never vote for anybody who stands for abortion. I'm just saying it right now. Boom. Because I, I don't care. I don't care about parties. You know, I mean, there's stinking dirty dogs in all of them. And, uh, and there's good people. There's good people who run. And I'm thankful for, especially our local officials who run in office to make a difference in a place. Yes, I think they need a hand. That's, that's a bad, you know. If you want phone calls all night long on certain issues, you go run for office, all i got to tell you. So, so I appreciate them. But what I'm saying is don't be divided by parties, but look at this issue. We're not going to win them all at the battle box. We should be out there voting. We should do our part. And if you have the ability of leadership, you should actually run for office, to tell you the truth, and run the way Jesus wants you to. But the way we're going to win things is this. We're going to win things by changing the heart of the people. And it's tough. It's tough. How important is disciples equipping disciples? This is a way that we change the heart of America. This is the way we change the heart of our world. This is the way we change the heart of our county. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another, the Word of God says. You know, God doesn't need anyone's help, but He wants and allows us and has planned for us to be part of His plan to make disciples. You know, we try to make it complicated. Just like maybe you're out there today. How can I be a disciple who makes disciples? That's not me. I, I'm not that person. And one of the most basic, basic, basic ways, the most, one of the most important ways to equip disciples, here it is, parents. This is a biggie. Equip your children. Equip your children. Moms and dads, grandmas and granddads, we must be disciples to equip disciples. Must. Must. This is where we've lost our heart and soul of America. Now, my Aunt Dale down here, she's a little woman, but she's got a heart 
bigger than West Virginia. I'm telling you, that's just who she is, why you love her, okay? And so we tease Aunt Dale because no matter where you go to a funeral, Aunt Dale was there. You know, we told her she ought to marry a funeral director. And, and uh, because one time she went to Hawaii when Paul was stationed in Hawaii. And I said, I hope there ain't no funeral back home. She's going to take a flight back home, make sure she had that funeral. You know, and so, because uh, she shows up at these all the time. And you wonder, where does that come from? Well, one day, a few years back, I'm sitting home. There's a funeral here in the building. I didn't actually preach the funeral. And so I'm waiting for after the, the crowd comes back and then we're going to set up for the meal in here. And I'm over there in the old area of worship over there. And I remember it. And Betty Dale uh, was over there, which is Jimmy Piles' mother. Jimmy's the funeral director. And Betty Dale was over waiting. And of course, our buddy Emery, he was over there waiting. Just, I still remember Emery telling Betty Dale that day, oh, Betty Dale, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, uh, you might see me at the funeral home tonight. I'm just not feeling too good. I'm not, she's, oh, Emery, now just quit talking like that. But anyway, Betty Dale looked at me and she said, Dave, your grandmother was one of the best neighbors in her area. We'd get a death call and before we could even show up, she would be there trying to take, take care of that family, arrange it for food, and doing those type of things. You see, what had happened was my grandma, a disciple, equipped a disciple. That's why my Aunt Dale shows up at these funerals. Why? Well, she was taught that somewhere. You show compassion and you be kind to those people. And you at least be there to make sure they're loved. See, that's as simple as that. There it goes. I remember a few years back, my Uncle Chuck's funeral. And as I was in there and they were talking about my Uncle Chuck, and as he's talking, I'm thinking, that reminds me of my dad. What they're saying about Uncle Chuck, dad's quite a few years younger. It reminds me of dad. And I got thinking, that reminds me of granddad. Well, what was happening? Granddad was equipping his sons. You see, it's not as crazy, far-fetched as what you think. It is our responsibility to equip our children. And you know, and so we need to be the church that begins at the very basic level and moves up and moves up. We parents need to realize that yes, sports are good. I played in them. I can see the value in sports, but they're not number one. Jesus has to be number one. And you can tell that child Jesus is number one, but they're going to watch us and they're going to see, is Jesus number one to you? Does he matter the most to me? If we want to change our community, then we need to be disciples, making disciples. We parents, we grandparents, we need to be making sure that we are equipping disciples, changing the hearts of people. And that is such a blessing to be able to do that. And teenagers, I'm going to tell you something. You think, what can I, who can I disciple? Little kids look up to you and idolize you in a way. I don't mean that in a real bad way. But they do. They think like you're the biggest giant that ever was. You know, you, you ever do that? I remember when I was a kid in school and I'd look up to some basketball player. I'm like, dude, they're big. Man, wow, i like to be like that. You know, but then I grew up like, they weren't that big after all. You know? Um, but you teens, I'm going to tell you something. You're being watched. You are. You're being watched. They watch you. They want to imitate you. They think that you are the coolest thing ever. What an opportunity to show them Jesus Christ in the way you live. I'm not talking about preaching a sermon. You know, you don't have to do that. It's the way you live. It's disciples, equipping disciples. Yes, it gets deeper. Yes, it does. We'll talk about it. Y'all might be sitting there going, eh, he said there ain't nothing about teaching. Yes, it gets deeper. And God has called us to equip our peers. I know the way God preaches to me, honestly. This is like sometimes the weirdest stuff. Now, when I'm getting ready to preach on something, God puts a real life situation in front of me. A few weeks ago, I preached and I talked about the Good Samaritan. I got a phone call here at the church and I was busy. I was busy, okay? And I remember that sign. He's like, This lady says she's right down here around our gas. Do we have a gas can? I'm like, No. Nah. I said, Let me talk to the lady. So I talked to her and I'm like, Busy, but I'm thinking, I am not. I'm just reading the scripture. I'm just going to preach on this. I'm not going to not do anything. I walk out in the building. No, no gas can. I thought I didn't know the lady, but I'm going, to go, I'm going down here. I'm going to find out where she is. Drove down there. Guy was in the car. And then the guy says, I said, wait a minute. Does this woman happen to be Mandy? And he's like, yeah. I said, okay, I know Mandy. Where'd she go? Up to the store. And so I went out there. And helped. It's like God saying, I'm testing you, Dave. Are you like the Levite, the priest? You're too busy doing your stuff and you don't have time to help somebody? So then this week, I'm talking about disciples, you know, the, the equipping disciples. A lot of times I look at myself, what I always do before I preach, like, are you really doing that, Dave? Do you really make any difference in anybody's life? Have you ever done any difference? And sometimes God does it through giving you hope, making a difference. Um, this is a cool story. And I asked him, can I share it? He said, yes. I said, good, because I'm going to share the story everywhere. But uh, a few years back, back before the virus, it's kind of like that's like the date now, you know. But it was before the virus, so it had to be, you know. So back before the virus, um, a young man, and I, I can tell his name, his name's Alex. And Alex was getting married. He was married to Brenna. And uh, Alex was not a believer in Jesus. 
He wasn't. You know, he said, I respect her. I think he's a real nice guy. He said, I just don't have any faith. I don't have the faith. And, and so, um, but he would come. And he would listen. And so, you know, well, you know, I, I just talked to him and let him talk. And, and, and so then he was given a book by Lee Strobel, the, calls, the Case for Christ. And so a few months go by and I get this phone call. He's like, Dave, I have faith in Jesus. You talk about some guy had cold chills and tears, man. I'm like, oh, this is so cool. This is so awesome. And so then the virus hits and some other junk happened there in their lives. And they're not living right around here and hadn't heard anything for a while. They're, they're searching for a church, you know, out there where they are. But then this past week, I get a text from Alex like, Dave, you get a chance. Can, can I call you? I'm like, yeah, call me some such time. And so he calls me. He's like, Dave, um, would you baptize me? I'm like, would I baptize you? Woo, man. So yesterday we were over here and we baptized him over there in the tank there. And, and, and I just said, like, your story is the story of the guy who had no faith. Didn't even know this Jesus. He wasn't a bad guy. He was a good guy. Good guy. But he didn't have this faith in Jesus. And now here he is going, like, I'm going to follow Jesus. And sometimes God goes like, see, Dave, even I can use even somebody as stupid as you. And, and, and so, Dave, just don't give up. Because I'm like, I'm nobody. And that's why I kept saying, God, I'm nobody. I'm nothing. I'm nobody. You know, but yet God does this. And so what I'm trying to say is that being a disciple, who Christ's disciples changes people's hearts. When we look at our community and say, why is the drug problem so bad? What are we going to do about it? And I think Barney Fife had it right. Nip it in the butt. Nip it in the butt. And what do you mean by that? I mean, sometimes it's tough. We've got somebody right now going through uh, rehab, and, and I'm praying for him every day. But you know what? What we need to do is nip it in the butt. Parents, we need to be talking to our children. And then, here we go, here we go. Here's a biggie. We need to be reaching out to other parents saying, hey, why don't you come with me over here to Hope Christian? You know, or, or hey, you know what? I had that problem too. And here's what I, that's these disciples, you see, uh, equipping disciples. That's how you change the heart of a community. And unless we get off our bottoms, unless we don't, you know, get up, and, then the world's going to go bad all around us. But God is calling us to be that light. He is calling us to be that light. Yes, He calls us more work. Marcus back here, uh, Chris Marcus, uh, the Cajun, and uh, he came here from Louisiana, and I still remember it. He came in one day and he said, you know, I visited a church in Winchester. Nobody spoke to me. Nobody told me anything about what was going on. So he ends up here. Well, he comes back. He comes back. And he's a Christian, and he, you know, he said, hey, I want to be part of the family here. He come forward to, to let folks know. I'm say, he's actually serving now in ministry, so that's cool. And the other day, I had to take a piece of equipment down to a sale. And uh, he had to take a piece of David's equipment down. And afterwards, he texted me like, hey, I enjoyed spending time with you. Would you do me a favor? I said, what's that? He said, would you send me something every day with some thoughts to help me? Don't make it real long because I'm not the type that can, you know, grab all that in. Would you send that to me? And I'm thinking, yeah, that's cool. It's like discipleship, you know? And, and, uh, but then I realized something else. God's like, if you're going to disciple, it's going to cause a little more work on your part too, buddy. Because it makes you think as you're searching to give it out to somebody else. You know, when Mike Krauss sends out the devotions uh, to a bunch of different men, you know, it, it makes him look deeper because he's sharing it with somebody else. But there's so many here, there's so many ministries who are doing so many things, whether it's book clubs or whether it's Bible studies or whatever it is. So yes, it gets deeper. But church, we want to change the heart of the folks. So is discipleship important? You better believe it is. Sean and Rick had a very ricky, uh, very wrecked up marriage. And, and, and Shauna, one day, she was so angry because Rick had been out the night before partying and drinking. He hadn't got up and she was doing dishes and she was angry because the kids were there and she was upset. But on the TV, she saw this guy speaking and she turned it up and started listening to what he said. He was a preacher. And he was proclaiming the word of God and it started touching her heart like she said, I never felt this way before. And she started crying. At the end of that, 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 uh, that, that show, it said, come and join us. Come and join us. And she thought, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do it. It was a local uh, uh, TV there. And, and, and so she said, the next morning I couldn't get the kids dressed quick enough. I got them dressed and I went. And that day I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And I thought that day I'm praying that God gives me strength to leave Rick. That's what I'm praying for. But God had another plan. He had another plan. She went home, started living for Jesus. And three weeks later Rick said, can I go to the church with you? There's something different about you, and I need that. And so Rick starts coming, and he had a lot of junk in his life. You know, the drinking, the drugs, uh, not being sexually faithful, all these types of things. 
And it was a battle, but about five weeks later, Rick himself becomes a follower of Jesus. And he had a battle. But how did it happen? Really, it's kind of like disciples equipping disciples. When she heard the message from somebody else, she goes, and then she lives the message. I'll guarantee you she didn't nag him. Huh. And that's hard. You know, I, you know I'm, I'm a fixer, aren't you? And so when you see somebody doing something, you say, you're just trying to fix it, fix it. You just drive them further away. And sometimes God's saying, let the Holy Spirit do it. Let the Holy Spirit do it. Shut up. You just live the life, you know. And so if we want to change our community. Church, this is, so, this is why our values are so important. It's not just the preacher's job. It's not just the elder's job, the teacher's job. It's all of our jobs to be a disciple who's equipping disciples. No matter where we're at, and we all start growing a little deeper in Jesus Christ. Can't you imagine? Can you imagine? Could you imagine if people saw Jesus in us and started following Jesus? You ever going to mess up? And my, my biggest thought to that is, when, how can I say, follow me as I follow Jesus like Paul did? Because when you fall down, you admit it. Don't sit there going, no, yeah, I know, I'm a mess. That's why I need Jesus too. You know, and then other people can follow. Church, we can do this. We can make a difference. You know, next week, you, you can be inviting friends. I heard somebody else today like, oh, yeah, so-and-so invited me here today. That, that thrills me to hear that. I just love hearing that. I've heard that quite a few times, that we're trying to be light, growing closer to Jesus. And if you're here today without Jesus, he is calling you to be one of his. And you might think, you don't know what I did last night. No. And Jesus doesn't care what you did last night. He cares what you're going to do today. And if any of us care what you did last night, we better get down on our knees and repent. Because we all got our own stuff. Come on. Let's be honest. We might stuff it in the closet. But we're still all working on stuff. And so we're here to support one another, to lift up one another. And we need to be disciples who are equipping disciples. Let's be staying and we'll pray. And if you have a, a, a need, why don't you come as we sing this song? We'll have prayer partners.